Uh, all of us are delighted to uh, be able to welcome one of uh, Korea's uh, most distinguished leaders uh, here today, uh, Minister Hong Koo Yo, who is the Minister of Trade, Industry, and Energy of the Republic of Korea. Uh, a bit later on, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Myon Oh, who is our new uh, Director of Korean Studies uh, here at SAIS, will uh, introduce him more formally. Let me just say in general, first, how delighted I am uh, that uh, Minister Yo is able to join us. Uh, and also, this is inaugurating a new stage in the development of uh, Korean Studies and the study of Korea-U.S. Uh, relations here at SAIS. Uh, as most of you know, Korea is one of the United States' largest uh, trading partners, number six now. And for Korea, uh, the United States is the second largest trading partner. So there's an intimate relationship in trade, certainly, in investment, and also in energy, all of which, of course, are among uh, Minister Yeo's responsibilities. Uh, he also, he, well, I, I won't introduce in detail, but he has a distinguished background uh, educationally and also uh, experience here in Washington that informs uh, his analysis of uh, Korea-U.S. relations and of course, he has a broad global uh, perspective also. Um, many issues to be considered between Korea and the United States, of course, that also uh, concern us uh, here at SAIS. Supply change, fighting the pandemics, a range of uh, issues for common uh, partnership. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. O oh will uh, be introducing uh, Minister Yo. And so, really, I should say a word about her. Many of you uh, know uh, Mion, uh, who studied with us here at SAIS. She's a SAIS alum. She has a SAIS PhD, who later ha has served for the last several years also as director of Asian Studies with the uh, Atlantic Council here in Washington and uh, done an extraordinary job both of research and also programming, among other things, drawing uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson to the Atlantic Council as uh, to speak as she was directing the program there. So I know that we're going to have an exciting discussion. It makes gives me, as someone who has been deeply interested in East Asia, Northeast Asia especially, for many years, and now as interim dean, particular pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Minister Yao, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Calder. I'm very honored. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Dean just kindly introduced me, um, Miano. I'm the new director and senior faculty lead of Korea Studies here at Johns Hopkins Science. And it's um, so great to be back. And I'm really looking forward to engaging you know, with you um, in and out of the classroom. And I um, really would like to join um, Dean Calder um, and other members of SAIS community to welcome Minister Y'all, Hangu Y'all for trade, um, and we're um, we're very honored to host him um, this time. And it, this is the first Korean Korea Studies um, event um, throughout this academic year. So since we have only one hour, I would like to briefly introduce him shortly. But I just like to point out quickly that um, the importance of this this discussion today. And as some of you may know. Um, um, the U.S. Rock Alliance have um, really opened a new chapter as reference um, in the joint statement from the most recent May summit with, between President Biden and President Moon of ROK. And the two leaders have agreed to um, strengthen their commitment 
to, um, to really develop um, a future-oriented uh, economic partnership by strengthening cooperation, as Dean Calder laid it out, um, in supply chains, climate change, um, emerging technologies, and vaccine partnership, and among others. So, um, and all of the, this development um, really have a major geopolitical and economic implications, not just for the US ROC alliance, but for the broader Indo Pacific region and also um, rules based international system. So, um, to that end, um, once again, we're really honored to um, be hosting the new ROK Minister for Trade, Han Gu Yeo. And, and prior, I just wanted to say quickly uh, about. Um, his, his um, brief, you know, bios. So prior to his position, new position, Minister Yaw was secretary to the president for the new Southern and Northern policy at the Blue House of the ROK and held various positions um, within the ministry. And um, which includes deputy minister for trade negotiations and minister counselor at the Korean embassy here in Washington, DC. Minister Yao was also um, actively involved in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, as Deputy Director General at the Office of TPP from 2014 to 16, and Director General of FTA Policy uh, Bureau from 2016 to 17. And in addition to his public service in Korea, he also worked as Senior Investment Policy Officer at the World Bank for four years. And, and as Dean Calder said, he went to Harvard for his um, MBA and, and MPA, the Master's in Public Policy. So before I turn it over to um, Minister Yeo for opening remarks, I'd like to remind everyone that um, everyone in this classroom, this auditorium, is required to have your mask on uh, throughout the event per our university guideline. So with that said, I'd like to really invite Minister Yeo to the stage and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I would like to thank to Dean uh, Calder uh, and also Dr. Oh for organizing this, uh, this event. Uh, it's a, a great honor for me to be on stage in this pre prestigious institution of SAIT. Um, and also, I'd like to congratulate you on, uh, congratulate you on um, this completing uh, this eight, 18 months of this endless uh, Zoom classes. And <laughs> welcome back to campus. Uh, probably you are not familiar with this type of uh, event, but this is what they call guest lecture. <laughs> um, so uh, today uh, I'll be uh, presenting on this Korea-US uh, partnership. Uh, I named it as indispensable indispensable uh, partnership for a better future. But before we get it started, uh, let me ask you, um, you know, let me ask you some questions. I understand that you guys are the smartest and brightest uh, students in town, right? So let's see. <laughs> um, so, okay. What comes to your mind when you think about Korea? Just feel free to raise your hands and just say whatever you, whatever comes to, comes to your mind, comes to your mind. Okay, please. People. K-pop. Ah, oh. who do you like? BTS. You know BTS coming to New York City this weekend. Yeah, President Moon uh, from Korea is coming to New York City along with BTS. Yeah. So, okay, K-pop, the culture. What else? Okay, please. Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Looks like you're very academic. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that answer. So, uh, pop culture and uh, academia, and anything else? 
comes to your my mind uh, when you think about Korea? Yeah, please. North Korea. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah. I mean, in some ways, uh, people in the United States know more about North Korea than South Korea. I think. Yeah. Yes, please. Samsung, Hyundai. Okay. Uh, do you have Galaxy phone? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, tech. Tech seems to be also you know, famous in Korea. Okay, let me give you some uh, idea of where Korea is uh, in the world economy these days. So, Korea is a you know, manufacturing uh, powerhouse. As you may, may, as you may know already. So, uh, from the the UNIDO uh, study, uh, Korea's manufacturing competitiveness is worth uh, third, number number three in the world, and then car production, uh, number five, and then steel, number six, petrochemical, number four. So, Korea is very much a highly developed uh, manufacturing uh, powerhouse. Also, uh, if you think about the uh, you know, made in Korea, those products, uh, the global market share number one product is, for example, uh, foldable OLED is a 90%. So it, this is the market share of the global market. And then DRAM, about 71%. Uh, and let's see, uh, shipbuilding. 42%. But let me ask you another uh, question here. Do you know what was the number one export item from Korea at the beginning stage of our economic development? Or is it, you know, 19, early 1960s or during 1960s? You have to be shocked to answer this question. Could you raise your hand? Yes. We. She's brightest. <laughs> She's bright. Yes, that, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. I'm Korean. You're Korean. <laughs> but, <laughs> but not all the Koreans can answer the question, I can tell you. Yeah. Surprisingly, you may have no idea how you know, this manufacturing you know, powerhouse could have uh, exported uh, the wheat. But at that time, in 1960s, when Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world, um, many mothers, Korean mothers and sisters, they have long hair. And then if they cut their hair and then sell it, they can make money to put the food on the table for their families. Uh, so in that, during that time, many other countries didn't use this human hair, you know. Uh, they just use kind of chemical uh, those stuff uh, to you know make wheat. But Korea, because of the reason that I, exp I, I explained, um, Korean wheat were made of the human, you know, the, the the hair. That's why it was so popular. And then in the United States, I think the Korean wheat at that time really uh, conquered the whole market. At that time, uh, I just kind of did some research and nineteen. Uh, you know, 64, uh, this 3.75 kilogram of this, the, 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 the human hair or wig, human wig, was sold for $6, just $6. And then um, at that time, monthly wage of a factory worker was the $4 at that time. So you can see it was a miracle. It was a, so that's why people call the Korean development as a miracle of Han River. You know, how uh, in one generation, Korea, uh, from one of the poorest countries in the world, really developed and advanced to one of the most advanced countries in the world. For me, when I, whenever I meet with my friends from developing countries, I say to them, I lived in three different countries throughout my life. I say, when I was young, I lived in a very poor Korea. When I was growing, I lived in a very rapidly industrializing Korea. 
And then when I got old like this, now I'm living in one of the very advanced you know, countries, you know, Korea. So it is really uh, remarkable that um, a country grew from one of the poorest to one of the advanced in one generation. Also, Korea is, in terms of ICT or digital, Korea is one of the most uh, advanced you know, countries. For example, in terms of digital competitiveness uh, and smartphone penetration rate, Korea is number one. 95% of people uh, have smartphone and connected to internet. High-speed internet penetration rate is 83%. Korea is very small country, I mean, territory-wise, but then because of that, you know, even you know, in, the, in the middle of nowhere, in the rural area, people can get a benefit of this uh, internet connection, uh, broadband internet connection in Korea. Territory-wide, do you know uh, how, I mean, do you know what, what would be the U.S. state which could be equivalent to that of South Korea? Uh, or, you know, the, the whole you know, Korean Peninsula in terms of the size, territory? Could you guess? California? Any guess? Korea is the size of the state of Indiana. You know, Indi Indiana is not such a you know, big state, uh, but with that size of uh, you know, country, Korea is uh, seventh largest in, in terms of export volume, ninth in terms of uh, uh, trade volume, and tenth in terms of GDP you know, size. How did it happen? How did Korea grow from you know, that level of you know, poor countries to current level. I, I would say trade. Of course, there are many factors, education, and then infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, investment, or the political leadership. There are many factors uh, which explain the growth of Korean economy. But I think one of the factors is trade, open trade and multilateral trading system. So if you look at the 1962 and, and, and then uh, recently 2020, Korea's GDP has increased by 580 times during this period. But if you look at the trade volume, it increased by 1960 times. So this trade increased like more than four times, you know, the faster or bigger than that of this the GDP growth. So I think many times the WTO Director General uh, mentions Korea as a really good example of how a country can grow from poor, you know, poverty to prosperity through this open trade and multilateral trading system. So where is Korea now in terms of this uh, free trade network that Korea has built so far? By the way, uh, about, about uh, 15 years ago, there was a non-zero the FTA network in Korea at that time. But we started uh, this, um, realized that this multilateral trading system uh, is really kind of slow uh, moving forward and then uh, decided to pursue this bi bi bilateral trade network, connecting every country, and um, you know the sort of paving highway, trade highway, uh, for uh, you know companies to trade and investment with many other countries. So now, Korea has 17 FTAs with 57 countries, and in terms of uh, GDP per cap uh, GDP. Uh, cover, covered by this FTA network is a 79% right now. And then because Korea and 14 other countries uh, concluded this RCEP negotiation last year, if you count that, it, it goes up to 85%. So 
And also, Korea is one of rare countries uh, which have this FTA network with three largest economies in the world, United States, European Union, and China. That's why many businesses in Europe or in the United States or in Asia, they want to come to Korea uh, and do business in Korea to make full use of this, all this FTA network that we you know, paved with you know, many different countries around the world. Let me also explain the, our bilateral relations between Korea and the United States. If you look at on the, the graph on the left side, trade. It's about the 10 years uh, anniversary, uh, if, uh, you know, early next March. So we will hit the, this milestone of 10 year anniversary of this CORA FTA implementation uh, early next March. If you also see how that Coros FTA network uh, impacted the business, uh, trade, and also investment, on the left side, uh, the, the blue, the blue line uh, is uh, the world trade. So during this period, the world trade decreased by 4% because I guess um, it's COVID-19 the, the factors. So overall, I mean, you know, the, there was a contraction in the, the world trade. But between Korea and United States, it increased 32%, you know, despite all these uh, pandemic. Uh, so now, as the Dean mentioned, um, the Korea is sixth largest trading partner to United States. And United States is Korea's second largest trading partner. On the right side is investment. It's the same story. I mean, um, the, the bilateral uh, trade from bilateral investment from Korea to United States, it increased about 101.4%. Uh, 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 whereas the vice versa, you know, this U.S. investment in uh, Korea also increased 140%. Also, now Korean businesses uh, emerge as one of the biggest players from Asia in the in, 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 in United States. Uh, you may be familiar with some of these companies' investment, but if I just name a few of representative the investment from Korean companies, um, you know, LG uh, Energy Solution, they invest in Michigan, Ohio, and Tennessee, and in automobile. Um, this the Hyundai, Kia, they invest in Georgia and Alabama. And then Samsung, uh, the electro, I mean, the, the semiconductor, they invest in Texas. And also in the, this electronics, uh, this home appliances, they invest in South Carolina. And then also uh, Louisiana, there was sort of a, a recent investment from LG Chemical. And then um, does California and uh, uh, Tennessee, New Jersey, North Dakota. So now a lot of Korean business making inroads into the U.S. for further business. So um, let me just uh, to explain um, the meaning, the implication of this uh, Korea-U.S. summit uh, last, uh, last May. Um, I think the two presidents uh, agreed on this comprehensive partnership for a better future. And then, uh, although there are many areas of, uh, you know, uh, impressive um, this, uh, the outcome uh, in terms of this uh, uh, bilateral uh, cooperation in many different sectors, I would say these three areas as key potential uh, and promising uh, uh, cooperation area. First, supply chain resilience, and second, uh, global health, and third, climate change. First, supply chain resilience. Right now, these days, supply chain is a really hot key topic, and then especially in this strategic industry of uh, semiconductor and um, the battery. Um, the supply chain between United States and Korea are interdependent and indispensable. Uh, think about this, all these memory chips produced from Korea and exported to United States. 
uh, without the high tech, the sophisticated, the you know the semiconductor semiconductor manufacturing equipment imported from U.S. Uh, you know Korean uh, companies cannot you know produce or manufacture these uh, chips, memory chips or you know system chips. Vice versa, uh, without Korean companies uh, producing you know 70 80 percent of the you know, global demand for chips. U.S., all this downstream industry in the U.S., it will be paralyzed. So this, in this semiconductor area, these two countries are indispensable to each other. And then in the, uh, batteries also, uh, recently SK uh, invested in Georgia uh, and LG invested in uh, the, the, the Michigan. And uh, there is a really strategic partnership between Korean company, Korean battery companies, and U.S. Uh, automobile companies. Ford and GM, LG, SK, they collaborate. They make joint venture. So in this re regard, our supply chain are interconnected as well. So now uh, one of the key, um, you know, the policy uh, priority, priorities for both government is to really work closely together to make the, our supply chain much more stronger and then more stable and more sustainable. So that's one of the key policy coordination between U.S. and Korean government, also from trade policy perspective. Second, global health. One of the key milestones from this uh, summit last May was this uh, Korea-U.S., we named it CORUS, uh, Global Vaccine Partnership. The idea is that U.S. has this, you know, amazing, um, amazing, uh, this vaccine, this uh, mRNA, uh, this new technology, vaccine, Pfizer, and Moderna. But Korea doesn't have that the fundamental, you know, the basic technology, but Korea is world's second largest biofarm production base. And the world is suffering from the lack of the shortage of the supply of this you know, vaccine. So Korean president have constantly uh, emphasized the importance of equitable access to the vaccine by all countries or by all, uh, you know, people around the world. So what we can do together between U.S. and Korea is that U.S. has technology. Korea has this uh, amazing, you know, production capacity. So this is very complementary. If we combine these forces then I think not only can we you know, provide or supply more vaccines to U.S. and Korea, but also we can save the world you know, by ramping up, you know, scaling up this vaccine production as best as possible, and then provide this vaccine to Asia, you know, Africa, Latin America, and all around the, country, around the world. So uh, this partnership has been one of the most successful and uh, most promising areas for cooperation. And in the meantime, we have worked very hard, two governments, the White House and the presidential office in Korea and relevant ministry have worked together very hard to connect these companies in both countries to, you know, collaborate, uh, you know, to make joint venture, do R&D together. And then, uh, actually, early next week in New York City, uh, they, we, we are planning to have some business forum uh, and where you know, some of these uh, companies from both countries will you know, uh, sign some collaboration, uh, you know, MOU, or this sort of arrangement. Third, climate change. I think also you know, Korea and United States uh, is, uh, could be close partners in this. Korean government is in the process of setting very ambitious NDC, uh, you know, the, our emission the reduction target by 2030. And then one of the key goals is to do that reduction by new technology, new green technology. And uh, for example, uh, I mentioned uh, the Korean investment, but uh, in Georgia, state of Georgia, a uh, Korean company, uh, Kyuse, uh, Hana Kyuse, he, they built one of the largest uh, uh, the solar panel, solar module uh, the factories in the United States. 
So there is also big potential for collaboration in this uh, green technology. So what's the way forward for our partnership? Number one, uh, deepening cooperation on resilient supply chain. As I mentioned, uh, semiconductor batteries and other areas of key strategic industry, two countries are interconnected. So we provide all the support and incentives for companies to you know, strengthen this supply chain resilience. And as a government, you know, from trade authorities, we, are, uh, we will work hard to you know, to resolve whatever issues arising from these, uh, the supply chain. Second, a closer collaboration for comprehensive global vaccine partnership. I mentioned, um, I explained uh, the, the complementary, uh, the logic between Korea and United States to you know, help this vaccine production. I mean, it increased the vaccine production. So we will continue to encourage um, and match uh, partner uh, these companies from both countries uh, for the you know, bigger cause. By the way, also Korea uh, is very much eager to make contribution to you know, this, uh, ending this pandemic as soon as possible. So uh, during this uh, G7 summit uh, a couple of months ago in, in the United Kingdom, uh, Korean President Moon Jae-in, he uh, pledged about $200 million of uh, donation, vaccine donation, uh, vaccine or you know, this cash uh, to uh, help you know other countries uh, for this vaccine. Uh, number three, advancing shared goal on climate and clean energy. As I said, Korea is one of the the first countries in Asia uh, to have introduced this uh, emission trading scheme in 2014-2015, and we enacted this uh, the Carbon Neutrality Act just right before I. You know, came to I visit uh, the, the Washington D.C. here, and also as I said, uh, we need new technology. We need to promote, encourage this new technology in a way to to reduce this emission. So, expanding clean energy and decarbonization cooperation. Uh, as I said, this battery is one of the example to be used this electric car. So. Uh, this is a sort of you know, sketch of uh, where we are and where we are going in terms of this bilateral economic trade cooperation between Korea and United States. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, for your really um, great, excellent, insightful um, lecture. And I, we were talking, you know, that you should be teaching at size. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I would uh, like to um, take questions. And we have about like 15 to 20 minutes. And then um, from Dean Calder first. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't want to take two questions and finish absolutely fascinating discussion. But you noted at the beginning of your remarks that Korea benefited tremendously from trade, that its growth was heavily driven by trade. And uh, of course, we have seen a fundamental transformation of the global trading system in recent years. Uh, some aspects, some positive aspects, you yourself, of course, have been involved with, uh, for example, the TPP negotiations, then the RCEP negotiations, and so on. But my question would be, how do you see the future of multilateralism? Because there have also been some very strong challenges. India didn't join the RCEP. The United States pulled out of the TPP. How do you see multilateralism going forward? Thank you very much for Thank you very much for that excellent question. I think that is uh, what we are struggling in the global trade community right now. Uh, I think in a way, Korea was very lucky to make full use of this multilateral system in order to grow and then trade with you know, many other countries. But now, obviously, uh, the paradigm has shifted and we are living in a completely different world. So going forward, um, I think later this year, uh, we have uh, 
the WTO uh, ministerial uh, conference uh, schedule. And then uh, that would be also one of the important occasions to prove that WTO and multilateralism is still relevant. Um, and then more kind of a concrete way of uh, resume this multilateralism is that um, we have also this plurilateral, uh, plurilateral uh, trade uh, the agreement, for example, uh, ITA, you know, focusing on this ICT, free flow of products related to the ICT sector. So this plurilateral is that not all the WTO members uh, join, but a uh, small group or, uh, you know, critical mass of uh, uh, country uh, can join for this negotiation and conclude. Um, then I think it's much more kind of you know, relatively easier. I'm not saying that it's easy, but relatively easier than you know, the, you know, seeking for unanimous you know, uh, the agreement by all member countries. So I think uh, we need to use more of this practical approach mm -hmm. of using this plurilateral approach. And also, <coughs> excuse me, I think um, you know, the next big thing in the global trade environment is uh, digital trade. You might have you know, to realize in your daily life uh, already that um, you know, many people, this, especially this pandemic, um, you know, draw many uh, people to this online shopping, online buying. It's so easy to click and buy and pay. Right? So I think, uh, but we don't have this uh, uh, global, uh, global trade rules or agreement uh, you know, governing uh, this the broader uh, areas of a global trade uh, yet. So I think one of the uh, practical uh, and practical areas for target could be this digital trade area. If like-minded country like United States, Korea, and other, uh, you know, this uh, like-minded countries uh, which share fundamental values, which is market economy, democracy, you know, rule of law, you know, transparency. You know. If, if these countries can develop some sort of a plurilateral digital trade rule, then I think it can make a difference. So thank you. Thank you, Dean. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, you know the Asia Pacific region is much more active right now. I mean, obviously that's uh, the the world's fastest growing region. That is uh, where the future growth will be. Um, and then, as I said, the, we concluded RCEP negotiation last year, especially during the time when everybody around the world was kind of a negative on you know, getting something done in this uh, global trade area. So I would say that uh, the regional this trade deal uh, agreement is more uh, active uh, and I think maybe also relatively easier than you know, this global, uh, you know, the aiming for this global uh, new trade agreement. Uh, so in that sense, I think in Asia, um, Asia Pacific, there's a, uh, a lot of uh, you know, trade activities going on. For example, RCEP is one. Uh, the RCEP could uh, be taken into effect uh, early next year. And also we have the CPTPP. Uh, Korea is very actively uh, considering uh, joining uh, the CPTPP, although U.S. pulled out you know, uh, in, during the previous administration. And also, uh, before I came uh, here, we, uh, Korea submitted our official intent to 
to launch this uh, digital uh, trade, uh, digital economic partnership agreement. Uh, we call it DIPA, uh, composed of uh, three countries in the region, uh, Singapore, New Zealand, and Chile. Um, you know, if you look at this, uh, the history of TPP, it started from you know, P4, uh, P4, yeah, composed of these uh, uh, small countries in Asia, but then by US joining and Japan joining, Canada joining, it expanded uh, into this full-scale uh, regional uh, trade uh, the regime. So I think uh, in digital area, uh, we don't have this global template for you know, future uh, digital trade rule, but I think this could be a, one of the useful template for future. Thank you. And more recently, South Korea has found itself kind of caught in between US-China tensions, such as with the bad missiles, and you know, China, I mean, South Korea for more economic fronts of that. How do you see the relationship, um, economic relationship with the US in the context of continuing uh, tensions uh, with the US-China relationship? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, that's a very uh, excellent uh, question uh, that everybody is struggling right now. Uh, I think um, if you look at this, uh, it's not just a matter of Korea, it's a matter of all the countries in the region uh, because China grew so fast for the last couple of decades. Uh, now, if you look at the landscape in the Asia Pacific, most of countries, their number one trading partner is China. Right. For example, Korea. Uh, Korea's uh, trade volume with, uh, uh, with China uh, comprise about 25% of the total trade. Korea's uh, trade volume with the United States, it's uh, half, less than half of that. You know? and in fact, uh, you know, the Korea, uh, I'm sorry, the Korea's trade with uh, United States and Japan combined is less than you know, Korea's trade with China. I think it happens, it, it applies to many of the countries in the region. So uh, there's a big economic stake, you know, big economic stake uh, at play. Uh, but Korea US is an ironclad military alliance, you know, for the last 70 years, you know, based on, you know, blood, tears, and then sweat. So, um, and Korea is fundamentally founded on the value of uh, market economy, capitalism, and then democracy, rule of law. So these are the you know, fundamental values that Korean people cannot you know, compromise. And I think in, in the recent trip by Vice President Harris to the Singapore and the region, uh, I think she made it clear that the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy is not designed against one country. And U.S. doesn't want uh, allies to choose between countries. I think that's a way to go. You know, we need to find a way to coexist among these you know, the big countries and small countries. Of course, there will be competition. Because there will be cooperation. But we can have both, you know, competition we compete where we can compete and cooperate where we can cooperate. For example, this climate change um, and then this vaccine, those are clearly areas where, where we all need to cooperate together. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And please. Uh, hello, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Um, I have a question regarding solar panels. Um, I know that China is one of the biggest producers and manufacturers of solar panels or um, production of parts that go into solar panels. Uh, what do you think the um, future of Korea's trade with China in regards to solar panels and then the recent U.S. ban on China's products um, mm -hmm. due to humanitarian reasons? Um, how is Korea going to react to that? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's also a bright question. Um, I think that we are living in a, a really rapidly changing world. And one of the changes is that 
the supply chain uh, it becomes very important. And before, uh, when the companies um, do their business uh, through the you know supply chain, they the number one principle they only needed to care about was efficiency and profitability. So that's why this uh, just-in-time system you, you shouldn't have you, you shouldn't have you know, any you know the stocks or you know in the in your warehouse because it's a waste of time and you know money, but. While going through this pandemic and also earthquake and some of the you know uh, uncontrollable big event, business begin to realize that efficiency may not be the only factor that we need to take into account. Uh, in some way, uh, security, this resilience, sustainability, you know, uh, these are becoming more and more important right now. For example, uh, in Korea, uh, one auto company. Uh, they uh, were sourcing one particular you know, part from China entirely. But then, I think uh, it was uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, that the, the factory in China was shut down. And then all the, the factory in Korea had to shut down. So now they realize the risk they are exposed to when they just concentrate on one factory in one country. So although it may mean that it incurs additional costs, but I think in the longer term, it you know, makes more sense to businesses. So um, you know, in the supply chain, uh, another factor that business need to take into consideration is this uh, uh, you know, forced labor or environmental ESG, the factor. So recently in Germany and Europe, they began to develop new les legislation uh, to you know, uh, require uh, companies to uh, really you know, to look into the supply chain, uh, the environmental and labor issue. So that, I think that is a future. I mean, uh, the, big, the businesses need to take you know, uh, more uh, interest in this uh, labor and the environmental issue in the supply chain. So Korean businesses also begin to realize that uh, when, they do with, when they do business with China or any other country in the world, they need to look at very closely and cautiously this uh, risk involved you know, regarding labor or environmental issue. Yeah, so uh, I think it's, it's not just a matter of solar panel. Uh, it could be applied to any other you know, products uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I wish we have more time, but in the interest of um, everyone's time, I think we have to wrap up. And thank you so much, uh, Minister, and I believe we um, touch upon a lot of important issues, including you know, the inter intersection of trade and emerging technologies and role of trade and how that uh, would fit into the alliance. So uh, we are going to uh, continue um, th this type of lecture series, um, so please stay tuned, and once again, um, I'd like to um, just thank you, uh, Minister Yao, and everyone coming to, um, to this event um, in person, despite the weather. Thank you so much, and yeah, see you again soon. Thank you.